We're in a summer series on greatness. How great thou art is a pretty good way to start this uh, message today. The Lord truly, truly is great. We've talked about great joy, great boldness. Last week, great faith. And today we want to talk about great aspirations. Aspiration, I looked it up, means strong desire to achieve something higher great. Well, then what we have here is great, great, <laughs> a doubly great. Because if you're aspiring to greatness, and the greatness that you're aspiring to is greatness, it's really great, great. <laughs> so I want you to think about greatness. How many of you here would like to be great at something? <laughs> there we go. Nobody got up this morning and said, man, I want to be a total disaster today. <laughs> No, I want to be great. But somehow greatness is a loop. For some people, uh, they want to have a great job. And somebody else says, no, I want a great retirement. <laughs> some say, I want great kids. And somebody else says, no, I want great grandkids. And somebody says, I want a great marriage. I mean, nobody gets up and says, hey, you know, I just want a terrible, I'm just going to be rotten to my, my spouse today. I mean, that's, that's not the way. We want it to be great. We want it to be great. And it seems like greatness is so often aloof. It's, it's kind of like in a vault. And I don't have the key to unlock the vault to greatness. It's just something that's always out there. That's why we have this aspiration, strong desire to achieve that greatness. It's locked up. Well, I want to give you the key today to greatness. Now, because I'm going to give it to you, because I got it from Jesus, and, and Jesus, I'm just passing it on to you, the key to greatness, okay? And, and I can give it to you, but if you don't use it, you'll never unlock the vault and step in and experience greatness. Wow. Well, in order to give you the key to greatness, I got to set a setting about when Jesus <coughs> gave, <coughs> excuse me, the key to greatness to the disciples. And Matthew chapter 20, verse 17, it says, Now, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, this is just before the Passion Week, and he's going to go, and it's going to be a trying time. It's, it's that, la that third year of his ministry where he's ultimately going to be crucified, <clears throat> and he's going to be buried and resurrected from the dead. And, and as he's going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, and he said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem. Well, of course, I think they knew they were going up to Jerusalem. <laughs> they're on the road, they're making their way up to Jerusalem. But he pulls them aside, and he says, we're going up to Jerusalem, and it's like, I'm going to tell you what's going down in Jerusalem. I want you to know. And so this is what he says. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. This is the third time he's telling the disciples this. You have it like six, chapter 16, chapter 17, and here now in chapter 20. He, the third time, it's like he realizes they are not getting it. You ever been like that? You know, I'm, I'm kind of like that when I step in front of the refrigerator door and open it up, and I'm looking for the ketchup. And it's sitting right there in front of me. And I look all around, and I finally say, Diane, where'd you put the ketchup? And then I see it, and then I know what's coming. Did you move anything around? You know, that kind of thing. Are you really looking, or are you just glancing and want me to find it for you? That kind of thing. And for some reason, they're just not getting it. He says, the Son of Man, that's a messianic title, goes all the way back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. The Son of Man is going to come and reign in a kingdom, in a kingdom, literally, here on earth. He says the Son of Man will be betrayed. He doesn't say who the betrayers are, other than he's going to be betrayed to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. And none of them seem to be asking themselves, well, I wonder if he's talking about me. They, they don't seem to be asking that question. They must be thinking that somebody else among either the 120 disciples or the 5,000 that saw Jesus perform the miracle of, you know, of the loaves and the fishes, uh, he must be thinking of somebody else, but Jesus is telling them that he's going to be betrayed. Now, now, this is like sharing some very sensitive information, don't you think? He's had this bottled up inside. He knows this is his mission. 
he's going to go to the cross. He shared it in very vague terms very early on to Nicodemus. As, a, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Same title. Very vague. But now he's getting more specific. He says, I'm going to be betrayed. And then Jesus says, and they will condemn him to death. He said, this is the third time he's telling me he's going to die. And he will be turned over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Now he's getting very specific. That the Jewish leadership is going to betray him. And they're going to hand him over to the Romans. And the Romans are, earlier he said he's going to die. He's going to die. This time he says he's going to, how he's going to die. And he's, he's sharing the sensitive information about what is going on in his mind with them before they go to Jerusalem. And then he says, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. Now he's talking about himself as the son of man the whole time. When he's saying he will be raised to life, he's saying, I'm going to be raised from the dead. He has been sharing his heart before they go up to Jerusalem and are going to engage with all the activities that will be happening ultimately in Holy Week on Palm Sunday, and then uh, Good Friday, and then Easter Sunday morning. He's sharing all this. The next thing we see is the key that doesn't work. This key does not open the vault to greatness. It's being insensitive. Then the mother of Zebedee's son, this is Salome, most theologians believe this is Salome, Zebedee's wife, the Zebedee sons are James and John. They're fishermen, and Zebedee was a fisherman, and, and Jesus called them early in his ministry. But the mother of the Zebedee sons came to Jesus with her sons. So there's the three of them. And then she kneels down and she asks him a favor. You know, I'm going to criticize her in a moment, but right now I just want to praise her. This woman believes in prayer. Whoa. Boldly going to the throne of grace, going to Jesus. Boldly bowing down and she's going to ask him something. The second thing I notice about this is what she asked him for. She really believes in Jesus and what Jesus has said because Jesus had previously said in the previous chapter, in chapter 19, that the disciples were going to reign with him in the kingdom on 12 thrones. She believes that. Because this is what she asks as she comes. He says, what is it that you want? You know what she, he, Jesus is saying? What's your aspiration? What is your, what are you aspiring? What do you want? And uh, I guess that's kind of a good question if Jesus were here today and looking at you and said, what do you aspire? What do you want? What is it that you want? Do you want your children to come to know Christ? Uh, do you want a strong marriage? Uh, do you want a, a strong faith? Do you want boldness? Some of the things we've spoken about. Already. Do you want joy? Do you want to be, you name it, you fill it in. What is it you want? Oh my goodness. Can you imagine falling at the knees of Jesus and Jesus looking at you and saying, what do you want, man? Wouldn't that be great? So, she says, grant one of these two sons of mine to sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Whoa, she's got great faith. I say that this is insensitive, though, because it said then she did this. She blows off the heart of Jesus. He's been sharing. He's going to die. He's going to suffer. And then he's going to have to be resurrected. And he, he said that and all she cares about, she's insensitive to him. And all that she cares about at this moment is her two sons. Wow. Every now and then, you know, I'm a little more uh, on the head side of faith. And uh, I respond too often when somebody's sharing with me, I'm thinking of all the theological answers. And sometimes I miss to just say, whoa, you, I really feel badly for you. The sensitive side. Here Jesus has been sharing his heart. And you know what she wants? Not his will, her own will. Sometimes in conversation, you know, you know how it works. 
the other person is talking and sharing their heart and you're thinking of an answer or you've already been thinking about something else and you're not even listening to all the details because you're more thinking about what you want to say than what, you, what, what they are saying. And, and what do you do? You blurt something out and afterward you think, boy, that was the most inappropriate, insensitive thing that I could have said. The key of insensitivity, you see, you need a sensitive key to, un key to unlock that vault to get to greatness, but she's insensitive here. It takes sensitivity. Jesus said to her in a previous chapter, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when he sets up his kingdom, the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. She's only concerned about the throne. Jesus is more concerned about the cross because the cross precedes the crown. Suffering precedes the reign and the rule and the blessing. She is more concerned about the crown than the suffering he's just, just mentioned. Sometimes we get things out of order, too. We're more concerned about our healing, we're more concerned about our success, than we are about the journey through which we have to go to get there. To get there. Second key that doesn't work is ignorance. <laughs> we are often ignorant in, in what, <clears throat> what we're doing and fumbling with a key that doesn't fit. It's the wrong key to unlock the vault to all this wonderful greatness that God has for us. He says to her, you don't know what you are asking. Wow. You think sometimes when we get our will so set in our minds that we're praying for things that God does not want us to have. Wow, that's a powerful question. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Notice it's them, all three of them. She's speaking up for her two sons. And so she, she says, you don't even know what you're talking about. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? It's at this moment, <clears throat> I think that if I had been there, I hope I would have said something like this. What cup? <laughs> right? What cup? What are you talking about? What cup am I supposed to drink of that you're going to drink? Later in the narrative of the gospel, we learn what the cup is. Remember? Jesus uh, is in the, uh, having, having the, the disciples around the table. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He's already talking about death. The cup, death. In the garden, he says to the Father as he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me nevertheless not my will be done but your will be done the cup represents this agonizing death he says can you drink of the cup that i'm going to drink and instead of saying what cup they said yes we can Woo. years ago before i was even born my parents went to the Schofield Memorial Baptist Church. And it was on Joy Road uh, in Detroit. And at the Joy Road, they were having a campaign to raise funds to expand the building. And uh, there were two options to help the church. You could either give a gift, all right, uh, that would go to the building fund. Or at that time, they were actually asking for loans. So if you could loan it, we could do it now. We'll pay back that loan over time. And, and so my mom and dad had agreed that they would take $1,000 and loan it to the church, okay? And so uh, she's back, because that's what my mom did. She was back in the kitchen, because it was a meal banquet that they had, and then everybody was going to make their pledges. And, and she's back doing the dishes and after the, the meal had been done. And, but she hears them announce it's time to make their pledges, and she, my mom is so happy that they're going to loan thousand dollars to the Schofield Memorial Church. She wants to be the first one. She, she pokes her head out and she says, thousand dollars? To find out it was how many were giving a gift of a thousand dollars and not a loan. 
We can. That's what they said. Before they knew what they were doing. Whoa. Ignorance is not bliss. Ever. It's never bliss. You ignorantly make wrong decisions. People ignorantly reject Jesus Christ, though they don't even know of the great salvation that is in him. They ignorantly go over the cliff into perdition and eternity without Christ, out of ignorance. Ignorance, ignorance. Ignorance is not the key that opens the vault to greatness. It never is. You need to know. You need to know. You need to know. Jesus said to them, okay, you will indeed drink from my cup. Ooh. Now, I'm not sure they know yet. But just fast forward. It's Good Friday. Jesus is on a cross. And instead of two thrones, there are two crosses side by side. Salome is there with Mary and Mary and John, her son, John the Apostle. They're there watching. I think she's starting to realize this is the cup. This is the cup that Jesus says that my sons will participate when they said, we can, <laughs> we can. Her son James will become the first martyr of the church. Her son John will die a lonely man on the Isle of Patmos, exiled by the Roman Empire, but he'll have a visit from Jesus to write the book of the Revelation. Wow. Life is not going to be easy. <clears throat> Jesus never promised us an easy life. You, you do get that, right? I remember years ago there was the gospel track, <clears throat> God has a wonderful plan for your life. Oh, really? <laughs> they obviously didn't read the, the gospel that I've read <clears throat> because the, he said, take up your cross. That's not easy. But it is very rewarding because at the end it brings eternal life. It brings eternal life. You will indeed drink from the cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not for me to grant. Jesus is saying, wait, it's my Father in heaven. He says, these places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Do you notice it doesn't even say it's among the 12. Can you imagine? He just, Jesus said, there's going to be 12 thrones. You're going to rule with me. But he doesn't say any of those 12 thrones are on his right or his left. I don't know, maybe it'll be Billy Graham on his right, Mother Teresa on his left, I don't know. But he's telling us here, listen, God has a plan, the Father has a plan for everyone, and somebody is in that number to be on the right and the left, and God has a plan for you too. He does. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you're going to rule and reign with him. We are a kingdom of priests before our God. We are. And we're going to rule and reign with Jesus. Listen, he's saying, it, it's for the Father. You don't even know what you're talking about when you ask me for this. Now, here's the next key that doesn't work. It's getting indignant or angry. We are such a passionate people. It says, when the ten, the other ten disciples, they heard this, they were indignant. They got very angry. Why? Because indignant means you're angry because things just aren't fair. That's not right for them to be sitting on the right and the left. You, you know why they're so angry? Pretty simple answer. It's because they didn't think of it. They, they didn't think this ask to be on the right or the left. And they're angry. Why, you two guys, what makes you so special that you could be on the right or the left? I want to be there. And so they get angry and indignant with the two uh, these two brothers, and, and there's this little thing going on, and sometimes we are the very same way. We're upset that we don't have the popularity that somebody else has. We don't know much of Bibles. They do. I can't pray like so-and-so. I can't sing like so-and-so. And then we, we get down on ourselves. I'm nothing. They got very angry that uh, these two would uh, try to do something and usurp them. 
to be one up on them. And then Jesus says here, this is a key that doesn't work either. It's worldly aspiration. You try to take the keys of the world's success and open the vault to God's success, and it just doesn't work. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their higher officials exercise authority over them. What you're trying to do is climb the corporate ladder, the government ladder. You're trying to get one on top of the other. And it doesn't matter who you kick and who you knock down so that you can climb and arise and and achieve greatness. Remember the definition of greatness is aspiring to be high or great. And they're trying to climb and be at the top. It is our American way. Bigger is better, right? Right? Higher is the best. We always want to have more people under us than over us. The lady was saying, hey, my son's got a thousand people under him. Wow, that's wonderful. What's he do? He mows the lawn at the cemetery. You get the point. For a moment, the other lady was, wow. You got all those people. He must be somebody important. Having people under you doesn't make you important. Knowing Jesus Christ and your identity in Jesus Christ makes you important. Being an image bearer of God just makes you all equal. All of us are equal, image bearer of God. But we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. That makes me important. So important, he died for me. Come on. He said, listen, you're acting like the world. You're wanting to climb over each other. No, no, you don't do that. Christians don't do that. You want to lord it over them and... Then you're going to have somebody above you, you want to lord it over them, and you just keep, keep trying to be on top of everybody else. That is not the way to God's, God's greatness. It's paradoxical. It is a paradox, Jesus says. Not so with you. Don't act like the world. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you, there it is, Whoever has aspirations of greatness, you want the key to unlock greatness? Here it is. Here's the key. You must be, if you want to be great among you, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. You've got to be a servant. Jesus has turned everything upside down. Down is up and up is down. You're going to go by the world's up, you're going to be down. If you're going to go by Christ uh, down, you're going to be up. <laughs> I don't know if you ever remember that movie made back in the 70s called The Poseidon Adventure, where the ship the, is flipped over upside down during a, a cruise uh, out at sea on uh, uh, New Year's Eve, and, and it's upside down. And everybody's saying, well, we've got to get to the top of the ship, but the top of the ship is on the bottom. And uh, there's a handful of people who say, no, you got to go to the bottom in order to get to the top. And the ones who go from the top to the bottom, because the bottom is now at the top, are finally rescued and saved. Okay, I blew the whole story for you. Now you don't have to watch it. (laughs) But the point is this. It's a paradox. It doesn't seem right. It makes no sense that you're going to go down to the bottom to get to the top. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying. And notice what he says. If you're going to be great, you must be a servant. Most people want greatness that come to them without doing anything to get it. You have to be a servant. You want to unlock that door to greatness, God's greatness? You have to be a servant. You've got to think about who you can serve. Notice what he says on the second part. And whoever wants to be first, number one, (laughs) must be your slave. Ooh. Two words here. They're kind of synonyms, but there's a distinction between the two. Servant. We get the word diaconate from it, deacon. The deacons of the church are servants. 
They're not leaders, they're servants. But they are leaders because they lead in serving. That's the whole point. Does that make sense? To the world, that makes no sense. But to us in the body of Christ, it makes great sense. It's servant leadership. Now, you can be a servant and not be a slave. You just volunteer to serve, okay? I mean, you go to the restaurant and you got a waiter and the waiter is serving you and he voluntarily is serving you, okay? That's, that's what he's doing. He's not your slave. He, he's, he, but the word slave implies ownership. You want to be free and Jesus, no, 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 no. Listen, if you want to be great, you serve as if they are your owner. Whoa. You see, most people want to be served. They want uh, their kids to be good to them. They want their spouse to be good to them. They want their employer to be good to them. They have this idea of greatness. A great job means, hey, everybody does for me. Great marriage, everybody does for me. And, And it's all backwards. Jesus said, if you want to be great, you got to serve. Don't think about what you can get. Think about what you can give. I think we had a president that said that. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what can, I, can you do for your country? Famous statement. Listen, it's what Jesus is teaching. You want to be the slave. This is so paradoxical. It, 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 the world cannot wrap its head around this. But we Christians, we can, because Jesus gave us the example. The key to greatness is doing the paradox of going to the bottom to reach the top. Just as the Son of Man, there he is, again, calling himself the Son of Man. I am the Messiah that's spoken of in Daniel chapter 7. He did not come to be served. I think, think about it. When the Magi came to find the king of the Jews, the king, they went to Jerusalem and went to the palace to King Herod and said, where in the world is he? And they said, we don't know where he is. Because the king was not born in the palace with a silver spoon in his mouth. The king was born in a barn. (laughs) You get what's going on here? The example, Jesus didn't come to be served with a silver spoon, silver platter, and all of that. Jesus came to serve. He did the lowliest menial task. In John 13, it said, to show the full extent of his love, Jesus took a towel and wrapped it around his waist, took a bowl, filled it with water, and he went to each disciple, and he did a slave's job. He washed their feet. Think about it. What do you want to be great? You want to be a great parent? What are you doing? inputting into your child's life. How are you serving? You want to have a great marriage? What are you doing to put into the marriage to make it great? You want to have a great job? What are you doing to put into the job? Jesus wrapped it around. He went to the disciples and he washed their feet. How humbling and humiliating a task. They all should have been washing Jesus' feet. But Jesus knew the principle. It's a paradox. In order to be great in God's sight, you've got to be the least. Instead of being the executive or a CEO at a major corporation, you volunteer in a nonprofit organization. Wow. Greatness, greatness, greatness is not done by being served, but serving. That, that's what... Uh, our walk to talk was all about. It's about helping people in our community. What's blessing in a backpack's all about? Touching somebody else's life that I don't even know. Greatness is not found in championing how wonderful spiking the football in the end zone, flashing number one because I made the winning basket. It's none of that junk. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. I think it'll change everything in your life if you could just grab this paradox and say, it is not about me. 
It's not about me. It's all about him. And to give his life a ransom for many. This is where it gets really, really tough. Greatness comes not by getting, but by giving. Not by getting all the luxuries of life, but by giving your life. That's what he says. To give his life a ransom. Now, a ransom is the payment to set somebody free. You're willing to pay. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you to open the vault to greatness. It's going to cost you your life. You've got to surrender all to him. You've got to take up your cross and die daily, Jesus said. The word ransom was used for when a slave was bought on the slave market in the Roman Empire. Somebody paid the price to take ownership. Jesus paid the price to take ownership of me. But Jesus said it's for, for freedom that Christ has set us free. So that we, in our freedom, will voluntarily worship and serve him. We'll serve him. Look what's happening here. I'm going to wrap this up. The mother put her sons above Christ. She really did. She wanted her will. She was insensitive and in blowing off what he was talking about. The sons put themselves equal with Christ. Oh, yeah, what you can do, we can do. Hmm. The ten became jealous of the two. They actually became indignant and angry because they had a better idea. But Jesus put all above himself. Wow. He put everybody above himself. Here's the question. Where do you put you? <laughs> Where do you put you? Where do you put you? What are your aspirations? Hmm. What do you really want? If Jesus were here, say, what do you want? What do you want? What is it that you want? Here's the point of the whole thing. You can be great. You can be great. Look at the person next to you and say, you can be great. Yeah. Some of you smile because you didn't believe that. Now turn to him and say, you really believe it. You can be great. You can be great. All right, now, here's the catch. This is the, the key that opens the vault. It's a paradox. <laughs> you can't use all the other keys in this world. None of them work. None of those keys open the vault to get you into the greatness that God has for you. God has a greatness just for you, but you have to, you have to, to be truly great, you have to become small. That makes no sense, I know, to the world. But you have to be small. To be truly great, I'm telling you right now, it may cost you your all. It may cost you everything to be great. Now, but here's the key. You'll be a success. Here's the reward. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Isn't that great? Here, you're on your way to the bottom, and, and as you're going down, God's got you in his hand. So you think you're going down, but he keeps lifting you up. The whole time you're going, you're going down, but he's just pushing you up all the way. You're going down, man. But his hand's bigger than your hand, so he keeps pushing you. You keep rising higher and higher, and the harder you try to go down, the higher and higher he keeps pushing you up. And the Apostle Paul put it this way. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now that phrase, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, is he didn't think he had to snatch after and take possession of being God because he was God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, very form of God, did not think he had to siege being like God, but was made in the fashion as a man. He was made in the likeness of men. You know why likeness? Because he didn't have sin. He was perfect human. And being found in fashion as a man, here's the key word, he humbled himself. He humbled himself to become a servant. To become a servant. That's what the text says. You want to be great? You got to be small. You got to be a servant. You got to be a slave. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. That's what Jesus was talking about in this passage. 
I take up my cross daily and I die to myself and I live for Jesus. Became obedient unto death. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. That's what it says here. You humble yourself and God will lift you up. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 12. Wow. You know what Jesus is saying? I set you the example. Do as I have done. Listen, I humbled myself all the way down until they killed me. And God raised me from the dead and raised me up and exalted me. Listen, listen. It's a paradox. The key to greatness, greatness, is not about me. It's about serving everyone else. Isn't that what Jesus told us? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your might, okay, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That love always sacrifices. It's always about the other. I used to have the expression, me third. God first, other seconds, oh, me third, I'm last. When we have that attitude, we will find that greatness that we aspire to. Let's pray. Father in heaven, these are powerful words from our Savior. Help us to believe them with such, such trust and confidence that we act on them. Now that we know to actually use this key, this key to aspiring to greatness and unlock the greatness you have for us, help us do this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.